Welcome to Module 13. We'll be talking about generalized correlations in these lessons. So our goals here will be to learn to use the principle of corresponding states for thermodynamic properties. Now you've already been introduced to this briefly when we talked about compressibility factors. We'll be taking this further. And we'll be wanting to understand the relationship between Lee-Kessler correlations residual properties and those thermodynamic property tables and graphs that we've been using. And then we'll perform thermodynamic calculations using the Lee-Kessler correlations. So kind of where this all starts is people noticed that all the graphs of all the substances look very very similar. Now you can improve on the ideal gas law with some very simple corrections if you notice this similarity. The first person to notice this was Van der Waals. He's the Van der Waals equation of state guy and he says that substances behave alike at the same reduced states. Substances at same reduced states are at corresponding states. So in short what this is telling us is Substances at corresponding states behave alike. How do you define a corresponding state? Through reduced properties. Reduced properties are a way of measuring how different the actual state is from the critical state. So the key thing is going to be knowing what the critical state is. So we've seen this before when we did compressibility factors. This is the chart of compressibility factor versus reduced temperature and reduced pressure. Uh, this particular one is taken from the textbook by Felder and Rousseau for material and energy balances. But TR is the temperature divided by the critical temperature using absolute temperature. And the reduced pressure is the pressure divided by the critical pressure using absolute pressure. You can also have a reduced volume, which would be the volume divided by the critical volume if we believe that it's an ideal gas. So V times PC over RTC. Now hydrogen and helium are exceptions to all of these. The molecules are so tiny and so nearly spherical that they don't seem to fit the same model as everything else. So for those, you have to add 8 Kelvin or 8 atmospheres to the critical temperature or pressure in the formulas. But other than those two, everything else seems to work very well using these reduced temperature and pressure values. Now the idea is, back on this compressibility chart, that all points pass through the point at their critical point that on this graph is at a pressure of 1 and a temperature of 1. And for all the temperatures higher than 1, the graphs are going to follow these curves. And for things that are reduced temperature less than 1, so lower than the critical temperature, the graphs are going to come, start as gas, go into the two-phase region where they separate out and become a saturated liquid, and the dashed lines represent the liquid behavior. And all of that was a very good way of estimating compressibility factors for many, many substances. Now, how people really first did this was they started doing graphs of TR versus PR for the Z that met the observed values of volume. And you can see that this is done for many, many substances, methane, ethylene, ethane, all sorts of things, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, water. And different sets of data are graphed on here, and you see that they all have sort of the same shape. And an average value of these for hydrocarbons is drawn in. Now the nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and water will be a little bit more different than the others. But they all, no matter what the substance, have something very similar to this. But they don't perfectly match, so we have an additional correction. The additional correction is going to be improved by using the Pitzer correlations. Omega is the Pitzer acentric factor, 
We've encountered this before. It's going to be a measure of how close the molecule is to being a sphere. Okay? And the way we use this is the Pitzer acentric factor is going to take Z naught, the compressibility factor that we found back in the old days, using that other graph from Felder and Rousseau. And you add to that the acentric factor times a second Z factor. So this is going to be our correction. And the sum of these two will be a better Z than we get from using just Z naught. So we've done Z naught in the past. We're going to add to this omega Z1, a correction. So if you were to look at graphs of these, you'll find that these graphs look very much like what we had in the Felder and Rousseau book. These are based on what is the Lee Kessler equation of state. And so the graphs come along. Here's our critical point. Our saturated liquids will be down here. Saturated vapors up here. You find a temperature, follow the graph. Okay, looks very much like what we've done in the past. It really is supposed to be the same as what we had been doing. The Z1 correction term for Z, well, this graph is a lot crazier looking, right? They're going to have kinks all over the place. and So for TR equals 0 0.7, you come down, you bump up, and then you come down and follow the curve all around here. And all of them are going to sort of do sort of a up, down, and curve around kind of thing. Okay? And again, we find the number here and then multiply it by omega, the acentric factor, and then add it to Z naught. But here's the thing that makes these very useful. It's not just can I calculate Z, which allows me to calculate volume from pressure and temperature, but I also can calculate those enthalpy departures and entropy departures. The graphs are going to look very similar. I'm going to have PR along the bottom axis. Different curves represent different values of TR, but the scale over here is going to be the enthalpy departure at the reduced temperature and pressure given divided by RTC so that it's a dimensionless quantity. And we're going to have the original not, you know, the zero version of it. And then we're also going to have a correction term. So these equations, like this graph was representing here, they're based on the Lee-Kessler equation of state. Now the Lee-Kessler uh, Lee and Kessler, what they did was they took the Benedict Webb Rubin equation of state and extended it and generalized it so that it would be fitted to the TRPR data. And they applied this to residual properties enthalpy and entropy. Now the exact formulas for these are in the textbook. I didn't bother putting them in here, but these have been tabulated and graphed in the dimensionless forms. So this graph that we just looked at there, the residual enthalpy, the zero, it's over RTC to make it dimensionless. We're going to add to that the eccentric factor times the residual enthalpy correction over RTC. And this sum will get me HR over RTC if I just want residual ent enthalpy. I'll multiply the expression by RTC. Similarly, for entropy, I'm going to do something quite similar. Okay, I'll have a graph or a table for the original entropy residual. Multiply, add that to the product of the eccentric factor and the residual correction. And these graphs, again, are here and here for entropy and correction terms and the way we'll use these is we will just simply use this information to do what we were doing with the residual properties or departure functions so we'll be able to find values for this and this using the Lee-Kessler correlations 
then I can do these calculations using ideal gas rules. So in the next video lesson, we'll come back and look at applying this knowledge to being able to solve a problem.